The following program is made possible by generous gifts from partners of Benny Hinn Ministries and viewers like you in this area. The multifaceted ministry of Benny Hinn is touching the world with the saving, healing, and life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Through massive crusades, daily television, feeding programs, orphanage support, church planning projects, and much, much more. Stay tuned for the next 30 minutes because this is your day to experience God's miracle working power in your life. day for a miracle from Jerusalem. We are going to have a prophetic, awesome program. Wow, get ready. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you what's happening here, which is quite amazing. We have many ministers with us from the U.S., of course, and England, and Australia, and South Africa, and India. Just they're all here excited about what God is doing. And on the program today, with these wonderful ministers of the gospel, you are going to meet a rabbi from the Temple Institute here in Jerusalem. Saints, I have news for you. The Lord is coming. And to see what's happening here in Jerusalem is awesome. First, Joe Vancouver, come on, join me here, will you? Let's give Joe a big, big God bless you. Listen, yesterday on the program, when we were talking about what's going to happen today, I'm sure a lot of people have tuned in just to see what's going to happen today. Rabbi um, Heim Richman, Heim Richman, whom you've met and yes. talked to, tell the people about him and also about what's going to happen today. I mean, this is incredibly exciting. I'll be thrilled to do that and honored and, and, and greatly privileged. The Temple Institute and the man who you're about to hear from um, pioneered a number of years ago with a passion to see the temple rebuilt in its proper place. I don't need to tell you that a billion and a half people around the world don't even acknowledge the fact that that Temple Mount was a Temple Mount, that the Jewish presence was there centuries before they ever arrived. And, and part of what this man is a passion to do and to see accomplished is the coming of Messiah. Now, as a Jewish rabbi, we all are Christians. Hey, by the way, this is the first <laughs> time we have a rabbi on This Is Your Day. So this is historic today. Yes. Wow. And, and what, a, what a privilege it is to have him because he's not what we would call a messianic rabbi, as some rabbis are. But he's a family member. He is our brother, yeah. and God's hand is upon him. And I met this man probably about 10 years ago for the first time at the Temple Institute. And uh, I'm so grateful for his uh, heart and willingness to be on a show like this with all of us crazy wild Christians and talk about the coming of Messiah. Well, because we all believe the same thing. Look, we are a part of the olive tree, right? Now, Ronnie Levy, come please, if you will. This is Ronnie Levy, his assistant. Give him a big God bless you, please. You stay right here. Okay. And Ronnie, Ronnie was, Ronnie was talking to me on the phone yesterday, and you told me you watched our program on television here. Yeah, right, every day, in METV. Because you know, here in Israel, we can look, uh, we can see you in uh, METV. It's Why would you watch our program? Because first of all, I like you and I love you. This is first. Then I love how you dress. Very nice. Hey, hey, you see? <laughs> now there's a good reason. Very nice, <laughs> very nice. You. And uh, uh, third. You mean you like the white suit? Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank yeah, yeah, God. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and. Uh, on the other hand, I love how you teach the people about the Word of God and about the Bible and about the, how to build bridges between the Jewish and Christians. And this is very important for us, especially in these days. And I promise you that I will continue to see you every day. So uh, this is my privilege to be here today. Thank you. And it uh, will be my privilege to be an assistant to Rabbi Richman. You know, it's so blessing to work with him and to take part of this important mission that I think that every one of us, everyone have to take part of this prophecy. So I hope that together with Pastor Hina, and I really appreciate that you give me the opportunity to be here today, yes. that together we can do something real 
for the, our future, for the, for the peace of the world, and to change something here in Jerusalem. And uh, let's pray to God for this. Well, we are very excited about meeting the rabbi. So are you ready to meet the rabbi? Okay. Rabbi, please come. Give him a big, big God bless you. I am just so... Listen, I met with him this morning. And uh, he had so much to say. That is so important to all of us as believers. And you got to hear what this man is going to tell you. First of all, I believe with all of my heart, we are living in the last moments of this generation. Not the last days, the last moments. We are so close. Yesterday at the Temple Institute, Rabbi, when I was told by the people there that 60% of the uh, instruments, the treasures are complete, and that right now as we're speaking the garment of the high priest is being worked on did you hear what i just said yes. they are working on the garment of the high priest i am so convinced we are so very close to the coming of the messiah please talk to our people they're all listening and they all love israel yes. Yes. you know you're here from all over the world and there's a lot of nice places in the world and there are other places that may appear to be more beautiful physically and more attractive and more appealing than Jerusalem. But none of those places are mentioned in the Bible. And certainly not in the way that Jerusalem is mentioned. Because this place was sanctified by God from the very beginning of time, before time began, as the place from which He will manifest His destiny throughout the entire saga of human history. And nothing can ever change that. That's a divine promise. And everywhere throughout the Bible, and the word Jerusalem is mentioned over 700 times throughout the Bible, the word Jerusalem is synonymous with everything that's good and right in the world. And so by taking a stand for the side of Jerusalem, you are taking a stand for everything that's right in the world. So when it says in Psalms 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, those that love you shall prosper, the idea here is that, you know, we're coming to a time now where <clears throat> every person is going to, ha to have to take a stand for God. And you know that God is drawing lines throughout communities, through, even throughout families, and people are going to have to stand up and decide whose side they're on. And to be on the side of the people of Israel, I think, I hope you agree with me, Absolutely. means to be that you're on the side of the God of Israel. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. And someone who is standing against the people of Israel is also standing against the God of Israel. So here the idea is, you know, first, of, first and foremost, we have to give you the deepest thanks for coming to Israel at this time, when coming to Israel is no longer such a simple thing. And we know what it means for you to come here and what it symbolizes, and that is very very important to us because you are taking that stand for Israel and for God's people for the Jewish people and the fact is that you know when it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem those that love you shall prosper first of all that's a divine commandment to pray for the peace of Jerusalem but it's also a promise that those who take that stand and who, who stand up for everything that's right and good in the world the side of Jerusalem are going to prosper those are the people that God is going to be looking for because those are the people that took a chance on him even when it wasn't necessarily popular and certain, certainly not politically popular to be on the side of Jerusalem so the first the first people that de deserve a hand are yourselves for coming here at this particular time especially but you know we were speaking this morning about <clears throat> the whole concept of building the temple and of course the idea of the temple is not new. It's really the central theme of the Jewish faith, the fact that the temple has to be rebuilt. God commanded us in Exodus, you shall make for me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among you. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we never received a cancellation order. Uh, not, right. for, not for that commandment and not for any of the commandments. And the idea is that we are steadfast in our belief that the temple is going to be rebuilt, and every prophet of Israel, without exception, tells us that the, particularly the time, the epoch, the era of the third temple is the time which is going to unite all of humanity 
and a true recognition and understanding of who God is. And that's certainly the time that all of us who share roots of biblical faith have in common. But you know, <clears throat> there's an expression, timing is everything. And so here you are now, and I believe that there is a tremendous significance all the time when we look at the mysteries of the, the Hebrew calendar and the fact that all of the uh, appointed festivals and in general the calendar of the Jewish people is a divinely appointed life experience. This Hebrew month, the month of Cheshvan, is the only month of the year that does not have any holiday or any festival commemoration of any sorts. The only month of the year. You know, we just finished now the whole cycle of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot, the Days of Awe and the Tabernacles, and now we're coming into this month which is not marked by any major festival. <clears throat> and so, you know, this month may feel a certain amount of embarrassment or remorse or grief over the fact that she doesn't have any of the special occasions on the Jewish calendar. But there's actually a very great secret that our sages of blessed memory teach us about the month of Cheshvan, and that is that it's true that it doesn't have any holidays that occur, occur in it, but that in the future, in the rectified world that we look forward to, there's going to be a very special holiday in this month which is going to outshine all of the other holidays in its joyousness, and that is that this is going to be the month of the dedication ceremony of the new temple. And I bet you didn't know that. No, I did not know that. That's amazing. So here you have chosen to come now at this time, uh, unbeknownst to you that this is, as it were, on hold for such an important occasion as the dedication of the temple. And here we sit now opposite the site of the Holy Temple. So this is something replete with a great deal of, of meaning. Now, Rabbi, I, I want you to tell our people, as you did to me this morning, with me this morning, about the, 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 the preparation that our in, uh, in place now and are taking place now for the rebuilding of the temple? We believe, the Jewish people believe, that it is a positive commandment to rebuild the temple. This commandment is not dependent upon uh, anything supernatural to happen, uh, and it's certainly not dependent on, um, on some initiative for God to launch, and it's not dependent even on the coming of the Messiah. It's something like the other commandments which we are obligated in as far as our, a facet of our relationship with God. So just as the Jewish people are obligated to keep the Shabbat, the Sabbath, just as the Jewish people are obligated in the dietary law, so also we have an obligation to rebuild the temple. Obviously, it's difficult to separate the issue of the temple from its political overtones. I'm not a politician and neither is our organization in any way political but you know the temple does not go in for example Manhattan or Manchester England it goes right here which as you can see at the moment is a little bit crowded with some other things so obviously in any discourse that a diplomatic way of putting it so obviously one of the most important questions that comes up is how exactly is this going to come about and when and obviously uh, it would be, take a very arrogant person to tell you exactly how it's going to come about and exactly when because we don't have a hotline and we also don't tell God what to do. The cornerstone of Jewish faith is that God commands and we do, not the other way around. We don't tell him how to do it. So I can't tell you exactly, not being his spokesman, I can't tell you exactly how it's going to come about. But all that we can do is to have the faith and the integrity to do precisely that, what we can do, to do as much as possible today to be as occupied as possible with the concept of the rebuilding of the temple. And that's really the background of all of the work that we've taken on, which is to try to prepare as much as possible for the restoration of the divine service of the temple. Now, Rabbi, you said something most amazing today about Aaron and his descendants. Would you mind repeating that? That's right. I mentioned that. Listen to this. Amazing. You know, <clears throat> the people who are officiating in the temple, the men are called the Kohanim, the descendants of Aaron, and they are the ones who are responsible for the daily service of the temple. And all of these men are descended from Aaron. There are many thousands of the ordinary priests. They don't serve all at once, but they take turns. And there's the one high priest who is elected by a body called the Sanhedrin, which is the supreme body of Jewish wisdom and legislature. And there is a very amazing idea, which is that a number of years ago it was discovered that there is a particular scientific and even medical proof that we can 
uh, used to determine who is descended from Aaron because there is a particular chromosome which is peculiar to all Jewish males that are descended from Aaron that no one else in the world has. No other female Jews even descended from Aaron, no other people, but any Jew from all over the world, whether they are black or white, from whatever country their origin is, they all share this particular chromosome. Why is that an important and exciting thing? Because there are two verses in the Bible which tell us that God says that between me and Aaron, it is an eternal covenant forever. So we see how the word of God never comes up empty. The fact that the temple has not yet been rebuilt does not matter. These men carry that very word as an imprint in their very makeup, in their very bodies, waiting again for it to be activated in the time of the temple. That is amazing. That is amazing. Did you hear what he said? Yes. Rabbi, um, I asked you this morning about the Ark of the Covenant. Yesterday, when I was at the Temple Institute, it was mentioned that in Second Chronicles 35, 1, 2, and 3, King Josiah gave an order to do with the Ark. Would you address that a minute? Because you said that it's been known that the Ark never left Jerusalem, that it is still under the Temple Mount. Please talk about that. There's a popular movie about the Ark, and it was referred to as the Lost Ark. And there are many, many theories that have been written by different people, different books about whatever happened to the Ark. But the truth is, as I was, I was, I was uh, talking with the pastor this morning, the expression lost Ark is not at all accurate for the Jewish people historically because we never said that it was lost. Although it was hidden, it was hidden very well. There have always been those that have known exactly where it is. And historically, when King Solomon who, after all, as the Bible tells us, was the wisest of all men, when he oversaw the construction of the first temple, knowing with prophetic enlightenment that eventually it would be destroyed, he oversaw underneath the Temple Mount complex the, the construction of a very vast system of all sorts of corridors and mazes and chambers. And one of these chambers was built especially for the time when it would be necessary to hide the Ark of the Covenant as well as some other items that I mentioned this morning. And we know exactly where that chamber is and we believe that when the time comes uh, those items will be restored to the newly built temple. Now it's more than just the Ark you said also this morning. That's right, it's also the, if you recall, the controversy that Moses had with Korach in the book of Numbers. Right. So God showed uh, his favor of Aaron by the blossoming uh, almond staff that blossomed. And that was to be placed in front of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, if you recall. Yes, God commanded Moses that it should be placed there. And also in the same area of the temple, in the Holy of Holies, was a jar of manna that was placed there as a testimony, as well as a container of anointing oil. Those items are there as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time we, the church, not only begin to pray that the temple will be rebuilt, it's time we do something about it. Let me hear a bigger amen. amen. You know, the rabbi said something very important this morning. That you got to put legs to God's promises. God said it would happen. It's going to happen. But he uses men. Nothing happens by itself. How did you say it? I love the way you put it this morning. There is a particular teaching which I was very moved to share with the pastor this morning, which I think for me personally summarizes the work that we are doing at the Institute in trying to prepare as much as possible now for the temple. You know, it goes back to when the Jewish people left Egypt. So we have a body of tradition um, called the Oral Tradition, which sheds a tremendous amount of light on Scripture. And it's recorded there that, you know, when the Jewish people were being pursued by the Egyptians and they came up to the sea, it wasn't such an easy place to be with the sea on one side and the Egyptian army coming. So God said, speak to the children of Israel and go. Don't cry out to me. Why do you cry out to me? Speak to the children of Israel and go. But it wasn't such an easy thing to understand. And no one really moved until one man who was called Nachshon, the son of Aminadav. He was the prince of the tribe of Judah. He, he understood exactly what God was saying. And he began to walk into the water and didn't split. And he kept on walking and walking until it came right up to here and wasn't able to, to walk anymore. 
And as soon as he came up to that point, to his nostrils, then the sea split. And it stayed open the entire night for the whole people of Israel to walk through. Because until one man did everything that he possibly could do, not any more than he could possibly do, but not a drop less, then God did not step in because he makes miracles all the time for us were to, were to recognize him. But we, in this world, give the legs for those miracles to stand by our sign of life that we have to show him, that we are interested, that we are willing to do as much as we possibly can do. Wow. That was very, very powerful. In other words, God will not do it without us. We cannot do it without Him. He will not do it without us. It's just that simple. So all of you watching this program, it's time we believers begin to pray that the temple will be rebuilt. It's in the Word. And like I said to the rabbi this morning, I'll tell you, God said it, it's going to happen. It's just that simple. Who thought that Israel would be a nation? For 2,000 years they were scattered around the world. Who thought it would happen? Those who believed, believed it would happen. Hitler and the Nazis tried to destroy the Jewish people. Yet in their darkest moment, a miracle was taking place. And that miracle was a birth in their hearts that said, we will go to Jerusalem. The Jewish people around the world began to dream, began to desire with all of their hearts to see their land restored. That dream had to live before it became reality. And I believe that God is about to give life to this dream of rebuilding the temple. And then it will become reality. It's the Word of God. What part we will play, we don't know. But I believe it's important we all pray and seek God. And if God says, do this, well, go do it. Look, 2,000 years ago, God's people left this land. 2,000 years later, they come back speaking the same language. Because the prophet Jeremiah said they would. Now, many of you live in the U.S. and other parts of the world, but your forefathers were probably Italians and Swedes and Greeks. Most of you don't speak Italian, Greek, and whatever else. And only after 200 years, 2,000 years is what we're talking about. They come back speaking the same language 2,000 years later. Why? Because God said it. A miracle took place. They were scattered for 2,000 years. God said, I'll bring you back. When the whole world said, impossible. It happened. Why? God said it. Now you're looking at another, what looks like impossible situation. No, no. God said it. It's going to happen. That's simple. Satan and all his hosts cannot stop what God said. It's going to happen. And the people of God said, let's stand, please. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to pray that God Almighty will bring peace to this land. Thank you, Rabbi, for being with me today. And, and I'll just say one more thing before you leave. Uh, we believers love Israel. We love Israel because the God of Israel is our God. And like you said earlier, there's much we agree on. This Bible is our Bible. You gave it to us. With, without the Jewish people, we would not be here. Uh, where would we be without the God of Israel? Uh, Israel is our spiritual home. But where would we be without the Jewish people? Lost. We would be lost. Thank God for His people. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and thank Him. Father, we thank you, and we thank you for Israel. We thank you for your people. We thank you for your promises. And we do pray today that you'll bless your people Israel. In Jesus' name we pray this. We ask you to bless them and keep them as the apple of the eye. God's people said, and amen. Well, Rabbi, thank you for being with me.
Give him a big, big God bless you, please. And I, I want to say one thing just before we say goodbye. There is a calendar the announcer will talk to you about from the Temple Institute called Jerusalem Temple Calendar. And this is a calendar that just been put out by the Temple Institute. Uh, would, would you mind coming and talking to me about that a little bit? And now in it uh, is what? what? What's in this calendar? Actually, we made this calendar in order to open a window for our uh, work to all the Christians in the world. From this calendar, they can learn about the Temple and about the work of the Temple Institute and the way how they can support the Temple Institute in order we can continue and continue until we get the final house of, his, of, the, of the God. That's it. This is, uh, this is uh, our item, very popular item, and I hope that uh, you will enjoy it, and I'm and sure brand you will new. enjoy it. Brand, brand new. new for 2004. Wow. Yeah. Call the 800 number on the screen and make sure to get this calendar today. The announcer will tell you more about this. But this is very exciting because you're going to see in it the instruments that have been prepared by the Temple Institute. 60% ready to go. Wow, to God be the glory. I'll see you tomorrow for another incredible program. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. To Jesus be the glory and God's people said, Amen. The 2004 Jerusalem Temple Calendar offers a unique glimpse into the magnificent world of the Holy Temple, as well as providing a beautiful introduction to the work of the Temple Institute of Israel, which is dedicated through research, education, and action to every aspect of the divine commandment to rebuild the Holy Temple. This beautiful calendar is filled with illustrations depicting various aspects of daily life in the ancient temple, along with photographs of some of the actual sacred vessels that have been recreated by the craftsmen and scholars of the Temple Institute. In addition, the months, feasts, festivals, holidays, and seasons of the Hebrew calendar are noted along with historical explanations. And now for a limited time during these special This Is Your Day programs from the Holy Land, Benny Hinn is making the 2004 Jerusalem Temple Calendar available to you for a gift of $35. Call toll-free 1-800-433-1900. Order online at www.bennyhinn.com or write to Benny Hinn, P.O. Box 16, 2000, Irving, Texas, 75016. Those who recognize and understand the amazing prophetic significance of the work of the Temple Institute will certainly want to have this beautiful calendar in their homes. Write, call, or order online today. Benny Hinn's next great miracle crusade will be in Waco, Texas, December 4th and 5th at the Heart of Texas Coliseum. The 2004 crusade schedule begins in Orlando, Florida, January 22nd and 23rd at the TD Waterhouse Center and continues in Phoenix, Arizona, February 26th and 27th at the Veterans Memorial Coliseum and Beaumont, Texas, March 25th and 26th at the Montaigne Center. Next year's Good Friday Candlelight Communion Miracle Service will be April 9th at the Kemper Arena in Kansas City, Missouri. For information on these and other ministry events, call 1-817-722-2000.